Hello, everybody, and welcome to Jubilee Church. My name is Dave, uh, and I am one of the leaders uh, of uh, this fine church. Uh, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here uh, to this service this morning. Uh, and especially warm welcome to visitors uh, and those who are sort of tuning in to have a look. Uh, we love to have people who just visit and have a little listen. Uh, and we hope that you will uh, enjoy our series, which is... Um, uh, all about Jesus and getting to know him better and entitled Jesus Dangerous Revolutionary. Uh, and uh, in fact, I want to make a little book recommendation. I'm just going to reach down and get a book. Uh, as, you, um, uh, as you tune in and listen to the, the series, um, we do have a, a book that we think it would be a good idea for you to get. Uh, and that is called um, Beautiful Outlaw by John Eldridge. Uh, and uh, he uh, basically writes chapters along um, side the um, preaching series, so the chapters are tied in with the preaching topics, uh, and so I really recommend you get the book, uh, and uh, it's um, really challenging, uh, so I've read a few chapters uh, that have really challenged me, some are more easygoing, the one on, on humour is, is quite easygoing, and on Jesus' humanity, uh, but uh, I've just read the chapter on his fierce intention, and I found that very provoking. Uh, and challenging. So I really recommend that you get hold of this. This is available from Canaan Online. Uh, I think you can order it through them, or you can go through your usual uh, online uh, book retailers, such as Amazon or eBay, or uh, other such uh, outlets. So let me recommend that to you. It's called John Eldridge, Beautiful Outlaw, uh, and uh, I recommend it as um, a really good read. Um, I also recommend, actually, alongside that as a sort of supplementary read, if you're really keen on reading, uh, there's The Jesus I Never Knew by um, Philip Yancey, which is also an absolute classic, uh, and also ties in with the series quite nicely. Uh, so that's a little bit about um, our preaching series. I'll be um, handing over to Malcolm, who is our guest preacher this Sunday, and he'll be uh, talking about Jesus's fierce intention. Uh, but before I do that, um, uh, just a couple of notices just to uh, bring you up to speed with where we're going as a church. Firstly, uh, I want to talk about um, um, Bags of Food or the food bank that, that is currently being run uh, here out of Jubilee. Uh, and I uh, just want to say um, just a few personal experiences of that. It was really a privilege on Monday to be uh, there to hand out um, bags to all sorts of people coming in. Uh, there were all sorts of people in all sorts of different circumstances. Obviously, I don't want to sort of share any sort of confidentialities, but there were a lot of people who were in really quite difficult um, situations. Uh, and uh, they were coming in, and it was just a privilege to be able to give them a good supply of food uh, whilst they were waiting for benefits or, or on very low incomes or in, in really quite difficult circumstances. So uh, that is a really, really good uh, project that we're involved in and just getting to know different people, getting to chat to them uh, and uh, making them feel at ease because it's often quite a difficult thing to come in and, and, and get a bag of food uh, when you're in difficult circumstances. Uh, and so uh, it was just a privilege to do that uh, and also a real privilege to hear how um, we are partnering with all sorts of different outlets in the local community. I'm just so excited to hear about different people raising money uh, for bags of food, uh, photos being taken, uh, and local outlets dropping off uh, deliveries, and, and people just going out with 200 quid in cash and, and buying a, a massive family shop and then just bringing it all round here uh, and, 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 and leaving it here. Uh, it's just absolutely remarkable, and I think it is a great opportunity for us to mix things up with the local community, get to know people in Shepparton, get to work with them, have a common uh, goal, as it were, in order to ensure that, ensure that no one is in need in terms of food uh, uh, over this quite difficult time. Uh, and I believe uh, that it's going to get more difficult, I think, especially as we move around to the winter and winter sets in. Uh, we're reading on the news of significant redundancies. I think uh, uh, just in the last couple of days, Rolls-Royce uh, have made uh, uh, several hundred, uh, if not a few thousand people redundant. Uh, I think that's going to carry on with airlines and, and, and different industries finding it really hard. And I think it's so important that we as a church step up in terms of helping out people in need. So can I just encourage you to look at the slide, uh, which I think that will come up at the um, end of this service, uh, in terms of the things that we need uh, and uh, that you can continue to help us out with. So uh, if I could encourage you in that, that would be great. 
Um, it also uh, is my privilege to share our craft activity. Uh, Joe's telling me that we're giving out this craft activity to uh, all sorts of people around Shepton, which is really exciting. Uh, so it's not just um, our usual attenders, but uh, uh, different people are asking for the craft activity, and she tells me that uh, she's handing them out to different families, obviously because they're so good. Uh, and so uh, I'm just going to share this week's craft activity. If you remember last week, um, the main passage that I talked about uh, was... Um, Jesus and his disciples and, and telling them to let out their nets on the other side uh, and catch lots of fish. Uh, that was a humorous uh, story that I told. Uh, and so in order to follow that up, they're very good art craft people. They're very faithful to the, um, to the preach. Uh, and so Mary, again, has come up with an excellent uh, thing, is what you do is you take your picture of the disciples, uh, you colour it in, you then have a few um, fish, that are also uh, available to you. I think the plan is that you cut them out uh, and then you put them in the water. Uh, and then finally, there's a bit of string that you then have to arrange very cunning. I think this is quite tricky actually to arrange the string in a net-like formation and stick it down to your bit of paper in order to catch all these fish and to show the miracle uh, that Jesus uh, played on his disciples effectively, uh, which was to catch loads of fish and remind them that he was alive uh, and he had great plans for them. So, uh, yeah, you should have received your craft ingredients, which Joe will have uh, circulated. Uh, and so, sorry, it's a very long word actually for a children's activity that Joe will have brought round to you uh, and, uh, and you'll be able to do that. So, uh, great with that. If you uh, want to get on with that, that would be brilliant. Uh, I'm just going to put that down uh, and um, just also a little reminder that at the end of this service, so after Malcolm's talk, uh, we will be breaking bread. So if I could encourage you to get your supplies together um, before we do that, so uh, have a little rummage around um, your kitchen cupboards uh, and uh, find some bread. Uh, and uh, any old bread will do, even packet bread, even old packet bread. Uh, I almost brought my own old packet bread along today, but I thought that wouldn't be very good. So I did actually go out and buy a nice little brioche, uh, which is here. Uh, and uh, also, if you want to use wine, or equally if you want to use Ribena, or you want to use um, uh, some sort of um, substitute to wine, then that is great. Uh, and if you get those ready, uh, and then we can uh, do that together uh, at the end of the service to remind us of how good Jesus has been to us all. So, uh, it is my privilege to now pass you on to Malcolm uh, Kays, who's a very good friend of this church. He's been supporting us for many, many years, uh, and he's a good friend of mine. He's a good friend of the leadership of the church. He's seen us through many storms and difficulties, uh, and, uh, and so it's great that he's offered to guest preach to us from his house, uh, and so he's going to talk about Jesus's fierce intention. Uh, and so I'm just going to hand over to him now. Greetings, Jubilee Church, Shepparton. It's a pity we can't meet together in these days, but it's really good to have fellowship with you, and I hope I can serve you well as I share something from the Bible later on. Well done to you as a church for continuing your good work through the food bank and other initiatives to serve people in Shepparton and around the area. I know it's a significant help and I know it's greatly appreciated as well. So well done. You might be stuck at home not feeling you're offering much uh, in witness or help, but in some ways you can do that just as you deal with these days in good spirit and good heart as you show God's grace and also the hope that you have to others, whether that be people you're living with or whether it be people that you communicate with online or even at a distance uh, over a fence or something. Continue to be witnesses to God's hope and God's goodness. Am and I have been in lockdown for quite a few weeks now just recently, I've been able to get out and play a little bit of golf, but uh, Pam has been designated as extremely vulnerable, and that's because of previous illnesses, not because she's married to me, although that probably doesn't help her. But we're doing really well, and we're being well served by people and family. We've got a daughter who lives near who's been bringing some food, and people from Welcome Church who have been looking after us as well in that regard. 
uh, we're missing going out, missing visiting different churches, and also missing our granddaughters. You can see over my shoulder some older pictures of our four granddaughters. Uh, so we're missing them and our daughters and sons-in-law as well. But we're all going through that. We just have to be faithful uh, in it all. Now, I'm serving you as you preach through a series about Jesus Christ, the dangerous revolutionary. And I want to speak this morning about his fierce intention, his zeal, his enthusiasm. And it's really good to be able to look at the different aspects of the character of Jesus, because our danger is we conform Jesus into our own image or prejudice or bias or imagination or preference. I remember quite a few years ago when I was leading the Cohen Church, which is now Welcome Church in Woking, uh, I, before the meeting I started chatting to four older ladies and as I was chatting with them one of the young people went past and said hello Malcolm and he was wearing a hat and he had long hair and these four ladies were slightly offended and one of them said oh he shouldn't be wearing a hat. And I tried just to kind of ease the situation by saying, well, it, it, he'll probably take it off. And it's good, isn't it, that he's in church anyway, and it's really good. And then one of the other ladies said, and he's got long hair. So I said, well, Jesus probably had long hair. And this lady said, no, he didn't. And I said, how do you know that? She said, I saw him in a dream. Well, you can't really argue with that, can you? People have their own view and sometimes they can be fixed on what Jesus is like. And then there's an old joke, and I know quite a few old jokes, uh, about a girl, a young girl, doing arts and craft in school. And she's doing a painting and the teacher says, what are you painting? She said, I'm going to paint a picture of God. And the teacher says, but nobody knows what God looks like. And the little girl says, they will do once I've finished this painting. So very confident in being able to understand the full picture of God or Jesus. We have been not served well by depictions of Jesus in some films and in other contexts and media. In older films, Jesus is often cast as a Western white man, quite serious, very pious, sweet, ultra spiritual, eyes often gazing into the distance as he speaks some spiritual truth. But to be honest, I haven't met many carpenters who act that way. How do we get a better understanding of the character and personality of Jesus? Well, we look in the Bible. The Old Testament tells us in Isaiah, he wasn't outstandingly attractive or good looking. But we do know from the New Testament and the Gospels, he was gentle, kind, approachable. Children could go and be with him. But he was also loud, robust, provocative and angry. But even his anger was righteous. We look at the Bible, but actually, interestingly, a help for me quite a few years ago in appreciating the character of Jesus was watching a, a video series, I think you can get it on CD these days, of the visual Bible, Matthew's Gospel, and it was in the early 90s. And it goes through Matthew's Gospel word by word. And the person who played Jesus was an actor called Bruce Marciano. And his testimony is that both he and the director wanted to portray Jesus as described in Hebrews 1 verse 9, anointed with joy, above anyone else. So he plays Jesus as a joyous, earthy, personal man with a sense of humour. And he fits that into the script of Matthew's gospel. He's smiling, he's, he's joking with the disciples, he's messing up their hair as he makes a comment to them. And I think that's a really good and helpful way of looking at Jesus. Otherwise, it makes a mockery of what Jesus said when he was talking to his disciples. And he said, remain in me, I'm the true vine. And then he said, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Well, if Jesus wasn't the most joyful person, that's ridiculous for the disciples. They'll say, your joy? 
We haven't seen you joyful. But Jesus was a man of joy. So that's why they would say, yes, please, we'll have some of your joy. And in Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 10, the wall is rebuilt. And Ezra reads God's word to the people. And they cry. And Nehemiah says to them, listen, stop crying. Don't grieve. Go and enjoy food and drink. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, I want the joy of the Lord to be something that's overflowing and amazing, not something that you occasionally glimpse. So it's good to look at different aspects of the character of Jesus. I do hope and believe that the joy of the Lord is amazing. It is wonderful, but so are the other aspects of the character of Jesus. He wasn't pious. He wasn't miserable. And the quality we're looking at this morning is his fierce determination, his zeal. And I want to read from John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 12. Jesus has already turned the water into wine at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And this was his first miracle, his first sign. It says this in John 2, 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples there they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple court, he found men selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus was filled with zeal. Zeal means a great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Sometimes enthusiasts can be over the top. They can be overwhelming. But Jesus wasn't like that, but he knew what his purpose was. And we can call it a fierce determination. He was intentional in doing the Father's will. He wasn't drifting from day to day. And he was a man on a mission in enemy territory. He was bringing light into dark places. It was a battleground. The kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan. As a young child... He was pursued. Herod massacred innocent children in hope of exterminating Jesus as a young child. And then at the start of his ministry, after his baptism, he's led into the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. It's a battleground. In times with his disciples, trying to explain his purpose, that he's going to suffer and die and rise again, Peter takes him to one side and rebukes Jesus and says listen that's not going to happen Lord you know we can get our way through this and Jesus has to rebuke him and they work that through and he taught in a context where scribes and Pharisees hated him and plotted his murder he had to be fiercely determined not distracted not dismayed not disappointed but pressing on he knew what he must do he was intentional. He had a zeal for his father's work. And this sort of zeal is good. We see him as a 12-year-old in Luke chapter two, 2, when parents lose him in Jerusalem and they find him. He's, he's been in the temple teaching uh, the others. He said, I must be about my father's business. And when he goes to get baptised, John the Baptist is objecting. He's saying, no, you should be baptizing me, Jesus. And he says, no, it's proper to fulfill all righteousness. I must be baptized. And then when he's talking to Nicodemus in John 3, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And then when he's talking to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, the disciples bring food, says, come on, have something to eat, Jesus. And he says, no, I have other food. And the other food is to do the will 
of my father and to finish his work. His food, his satisfaction was obeying his father. And he saw that as a priority. He must do it. And then in Luke chapter 4 and verse 42 to 44, he's done all sorts of miracles and deliverances of people with evil spirits. And it says, early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he said, well, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of, in other towns because that's why I was sent. So he continued to travel around preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. In Matthew 18, it says from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And that's the context where Peter takes him to one side and Peter is almost doing the work of Satan. That's why Jesus rebukes Peter. It's a distraction. No, no, we're not going to do that. But Jesus knew. And we know that well-known phrase, many of us, he was determined, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And even when the Pharisees were playing some mind games with him, they said to him in Luke 13, they said, leave here quickly because Herod wants to kill you. And Jesus just resolutely said, I will carry on my ministry here. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. This great quality of Jesus, this dangerous revolutionary, he had a steely determination. And this fierce determination meant he wasn't passive. He didn't just keep safe. He took the battle to the enemy in a context where people were being oppressed by God's law and even extra laws that were being added by the scribes and Pharisees. He's bring, he brings light and love and grace. Where those judgment on people, let's stone them. He brought forgiveness and the opportunity of a new start. He condemned hypocrisy. He didn't like what he saw in people who claimed to know God or represent God. He called them whitewashed tombs, looking good on the outside, but full of dead men's bones on the inside. He cast out evil spirits. He brought light where there'd been darkness. People who had no hope of being ill for years were healed. And he would call people into a relationship with God the Father. He called them out of religious slavery and into a relationship with a loving God. He knew what his task was. He went into the synagogues. He set the crippled free and the possessed people. They were delivered of their evil spirits. In Luke 13, the synagogue ruler gets offended and shouts at the crowd. And he's having a go at Jesus. The six days to heal people. Do it on the six days. Don't come in on the Sabbath and do it. Jesus goes right in amongst the religious people and sadly offends them but he knows what he's doing he goes into the temple courts we've read about that and this one man Jesus empties the temple courts single-handedly he gets a whip he drives the sheep and the cattle out he scatters the tables and the coins of the money changers he's sensitive about the doves but he goes in and changes that context in one fell swoop Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Look at him. He's running wild. A little bit of poetry there for you. He's clothed with zeal. That's when the disciples recall what's in chapter 69 of the Psalms. He's full of zeal for the Lord and the Lord's house. Isaiah 59, pointing to Jesus, Jesus says this. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head and he put the garments of vengeance on and he wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. It's really good to look at this aspect to see the wonderful zeal and enthusiasm and determination of Jesus Christ and when we read through Isaiah 
59, we can summarize it by saying our sins have separated us from God and truth is nowhere to be found. There's no peace or justice, but our gracious God has seen our predicament and has been profoundly moved. In fact, he's appalled at our desperate condition and he sets out to work salvation for us with his own arm. He's determined to break Satan's power and he wraps himself in zeal, this fierce determination. A man called Theo Grunveld says Jesus wasn't resigned to his mission in a kind of, oh, well, I suppose I better save these people way. No, he was appalled at our brokenness and he rolled up his sleeves and got stuck into saving us. He passionately and zealously offered up his very best so that we might be saved. And we do see that towards the end of his life. He causes astonishment amongst the, the disciples as he marches into Jerusalem. It says in Mark 10, he just heads towards Jerusalem and the disciples are amazed that he's heading towards danger because they're afraid. And then when we see him going through the agony in Gethsemane, Lord, your will be done, not my will, your will. He submits with this zeal. It's not a resignation, it's a zeal to get through and complete the task. He submits to the Father's will. And then on the cross, he's still full of zeal for those who need forgiveness. He declares forgiveness on the cross. And then his last words, he shouts with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he declares, it is finished. What a saviour. We encounter this Jesus as a loving, gracious, forgiving and approachable man. But we also encounter this Jesus robust in his determination, in his fierce intention to obey the Father, to bring and to show the kingdom of God and to make his way to the cross to die for you and for me. What's the application for us. Well, I've got three applications as I finish. First of all, we need to recognize why Jesus came into the world. It wasn't just to bring some nice teaching and nice thoughts. It was to glorify and to do the will of his Father, to die on the cross and provide a way of salvation for us sinners. And Jesus did this with no doubts, no fear, no pretense, no false humility, no self-pity. He wasn't passive. There was no political correctness, but he was resolute and determined. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I believe I am saved. I'm right with God because of the radical determination of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who left heaven's glory and came down because he loved me. He died for me. He sought me out. He found me. He's keeping me. My salvation is based on his work on the cross. I'm so delighted that Jesus was determined to get to the cross and to suffer and die and to pay the penalty for my sin. Secondly, we're given an example to follow. We also, through the Holy Spirit, need to clothe ourselves with zeal, a fierce determination to press on. If you get an email from me, I generally close it by saying, keep pressing on. And that's a message to me as much as it is to anyone else. And I've had lots of feedback from that. Lots of people quote it at me. Uh, but it's right that we just keep pressing on. We're not passive. The worst thing can be is that we never bear the fruit we're chosen to bear because we're intimidated by our circumstances or opposition, or we're distracted by temptations and alternatives, and we can too easily give up. Now the Lord's patient with us. He can help us recover, and we do go through seasons when we don't either have the energy or the opportunity that we would like to serve him and do what we want. But Jesus is our example. Let's look to him. In Hebrews 12, verse 2, it says, let's fix our eyes 
on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Finally, let's thank Jesus. He wasn't distracted or disobedient. Thank you, Jesus. He pressed through, overcoming opposition and distraction. Thank you, Jesus. He had a passion, a zeal, a determination to do his Father's work. Thank you, Jesus. He had a passion for you and me. Oh, we need to pray that we would have something of that passion as we thank the Lord for him and we look to him. Let's also ask him that we might not be those who are passive or half-hearted, but we may, according to our gifts and our opportunity and the measure that we have, have some sense of zeal and determination to keep pressing on. Maybe as you've been listening to me this morning, hopefully you've been renewed in your appreciation of Jesus. This aspect of his fierce determination isn't always attractive because it's bold and robust and provocative. But I'm so grateful that he was like that, aren't you? So let's learn from him. Maybe as you've listened, you've felt renewed love and appreciation of Jesus. You can confess that. Thank you, Jesus, for what you went through. You never took your eyes off your goal. You never disobeyed. You never went to the left or the right. You pressed on and went through. Maybe you're listening as someone who hasn't put their faith in Jesus Christ, but you realise that Jesus wasn't a, a wimpy person. He was a man that was robust. He taught some beautiful things about love and about the God the Father and his love for us. And he was a great example. But the real purpose was he came and he was robust in order to die on the cross for your sin. And maybe this morning you want to trust in this robust and loving Jesus and say, Jesus, you've done a work for me. I believe in it. I receive the benefits of your death on the cross that I might be forgiven for my sins and walk in a new life obeying you. You can ask the Lord to do that this morning. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your robust faith, your zeal, your determination. We thank you that is just one aspect, one facet of your beauty, your wonderful personality and character, and all of it is perfect. Even your robust actions are perfect. Even your anger is perfect. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you weren't passive, you weren't easily distracted, but you set your face to go to the cross for us. We appreciate your work on the cross and your determination that got you there. And we thank you, Lord, that we now celebrate not a Jesus on the cross, but someone who is alive, who has overcome sin and death and Satan. And through faith in you, we can be right with God and walk in obedience to him. And I want to pray for us, Lord, that we might not just be passive or given up or distracted, but there might be something of your zeal by the power of your Holy Spirit in us that we might do what there is there for us to do, which might be different from anyone else's calling or opportunity. But help us to do what you've called us to do, to bear the fruit that you've called us to bear, that we might be obedient and we might also have some of your zeal in us. And I also want to pray for any people who haven't put their trust in Jesus yet, but who today might appreciate and admire this robust man who went to the cross for their sins. And today they might pray a prayer of faith and trust in him. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You are beautiful. We love all that you are. And we ask, Lord, that we might know the power of your Holy Spirit within us to walk the way you walked and also to be a help to those around us. Amen. God bless you. Bye-bye.
Okay, thank you so much for that, Malcolm. That was really excellent. Uh, again, can I remind you to read uh, the connected um, chapter on Jesus' fierce intention uh, that is in John Eldridge's book. I found that especially, as I said, motivating uh, and challenging all at the same time. Um, it's great to learn about Jesus' fierce intention, and obviously one of the most important things about his fierce intention was it led to him going to the cross, uh, and it effectively led to our salvation. Uh, and so um, we're reminded of the times when um, people tried to put him off his, his, his pathway to the cross. You remember uh, Malcolm mentioned Peter saying, uh, we're going to look after you, Jesus. We don't want you to go to Jerusalem. We're going to prevent you from dying. Uh, and, uh, and, and Jesus, uh, in a moment of, of, how should I put it, quite strong statement, said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Uh, not because he had anything against Peter, but I think because of the strength of the temptation uh, that was on him to, to just not go through with it. Uh, it would have been a whole lot easier for Jesus to have settled down, had a, a nice life with his mates, with his disciples, uh, and uh, just grown up with them and enjoyed their friendship and all the rest of it. Uh, but uh, he knew that that wasn't what he had to do, and so he had to fight that temptation strongly. Uh, and right down the line, we see different examples of how Jesus has to battle through uh, and have that fierce intention of overcoming the aggression of the Pharisees, of, uh, of allowing himself to be betrayed by Judas, uh, that wasn't an accident. It wasn't as if Jesus suddenly was, was surprised by Judas. Uh, he knew well before that that was going to take place. He could have easily avoided it. He could have just cleared off out of Jerusalem uh, and uh, that not happened. Uh, but his fierce intention came, kept him steadfast to the cross. And then even in the Garden of Gethsemane, of course, he, 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 he prays and, and he's in agony uh, as he continues to have to see his fierce intention overcome uh, fear uh, and, uh, and a knowledge of what he's about to face. And of course, all of this uh, leads to his death on the cross. And of course, his death on the cross is the central event uh, that leads to our salvation. It's the means by which we are saved. His righteousness exchanged for our sin and our sin for his righteousness. Yeah, so um, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. Uh, uh, he became our sin, effectively. Uh, and uh, we uh, were the ones who then knew no sin. Uh, and that is just so um, extraordinary. It's difficult to work out how it, it actually works, but it, it does. Uh, and so what we do then is we, um, we take communion to remember our, uh, uh, with one another Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, and uh, communion is, is a sacrament. And what I mean by a sacrament is that it's a physical act that demonstrates a spiritual truth. So by breaking bread uh, and eating it, we're basically saying we're accepting Jesus' body is broken, and then we're owning that fact by consuming it, if that makes sense. Similarly with his wine, we're accepting that Jesus' wine, uh, his, sorry, Jesus' blood was shed for us on the cross, and then we own it by consuming it. We're basically saying that these things apply to us. They are, we internalize them, uh, and we say that they're true of us. And so you see how a physical act shows spiritual truth. And so I'm just going to read briefly from the Bible. Uh, I think it's always important to do so as we, as we uh, just reflect on, on uh, Jesus' um, breaking bread. Uh, and uh, this is um, him with the disciples in the upper room. Uh, and uh, Matthew, uh, I think it's 26. Yeah, Matthew 26, 26 says this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat this is my body. So let's do that together, shall we? Uh, I've got my bit of bread here, so if you want to just want to take your bit of bread. Uh, and Jesus said, take this and break off a little bit. This is my body. And then just eat it and just reflect and think, Lord, thank you that your body was broken for me. Thank you that your body was broken for us. Thank you. Uh, that in order to make us whole, you allowed yourself to be broken. Okay, and moving on. Then uh, Jesus took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't that great? So we then take some wine. Um, I'm just using one of the church communion cups here. Uh, and I'll just take the cork off very delicately, pouring just a little bit. So if you just want to take your little glass of wine or your glass of juice or, or whatever, and uh, we just want to say a little prayer before we do this. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you shed your blood for us on the cross. Thank you that for your, uh, by the spilling of your blood, uh, Lord, um, we are made clean. Uh, and uh, Lord, we thank you for that as well. Uh, and so we want to do this. We want to take this blood into ourselves, as it were, uh, in remembrance of what you have done for us. In your precious name. Amen. Would you just like to take a little sip? And now what I'm going to suggest we do is just we have a moment of quiet where we just confess our sins in our heart. This is Jesus died for a purpose. He died for the wrong things that we've done. So why don't we just take a little moment uh, to um, um, internally confess our sins to him. So we're just going to have a couple of seconds of quiet as we do that together. And so, Lord Jesus, we just want to confess our sins. We want to say we're sorry. We want to ask for your forgiveness. And we want to recognize that your death on the cross uh, has cleansed us from sin. Uh, and, Lord, just as you displayed a fierce intention to go to the cross, uh, help us to have a fierce intention to say no to sin uh, and to resist sin uh, and to um, take hold of scriptures like... Um, uh, grace gives us the ability to say no to sin, uh, or no temptation has ceased to accept that which is common to man, and God is faithful, and he will provide a way out. Uh, Lord, help us to have that fierce determ determination to um, stay free from sin uh, and to follow you. Uh, in Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, that's good. Now, just a quick reminder, don't forget to um, tune into the worship. Uh, um, it's a little bit strange for some. Now, worship is coming at the end of their service rather than at the beginning, so we tend to watch the uh, uh, introduction and then the talk and then a time of worship, uh, which works really well. But uh, really important to, to worship together. So um, let me encourage you in that. Also, I can encourage you to just have a look at a couple of the slides, make a note of the things that are needed uh, for bags of food. And finally, thanks so much to Malcolm uh, for his excellent talk. Uh, and uh, uh, it's my prayer that we remain during this time of lockdown, this time of difficulty, that we remain uh, really determined to see the kingdom advance uh, and to see different people come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Uh, and uh, can I just say also, if you're watching and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, then please get in touch with us actually, or uh, um, just make contact with us and say, actually, I want to uh, think about becoming a Christian. We'd love to talk that through with you. You can contact us through our website uh, and uh, talk to us about that. So God bless you. Uh, have a great day. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next Sunday.